girls. Uh, today's topic is recording in the box versus out of the box. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the expert panelists. So uh, Vera Baramji, she is an audio engineer specializing in studio recording and mixing. Her entrance into the industry was through the legendary Electric Lady Studios in Greenwich Village here in New York. Uh, where she was the assistant manager and the staff engineer. There, she worked with major labels and high profile clients such as Patti Smith, U2, Lana Del Rey, Sarah Bareilles, and HBO, just to name a few. As an engineer and assistant studio manager, she gained a range of experience from the back end of the music business to the creative and to the technical workings of actually running the sessions. Siren outside, excuse me. <laughs> But ultimately, uh, those two full-time role, uh, roles drove her to pursue opportunities as a freelancer. So after Electric Lady, she began working with an LA-based producer, Jonathan Wilson, where they traveled to Haiti to work with Jackson Brown. They went to LA for Father John Misty's Pure Comedy album. And she also engineered remote sessions for Roger Waters and Lucius at the start of their world tour. And of course, she's kept herself busy here in New York with local artists such as Maya Hawk. Emma Camaras, um, producer, songwriter, Jesse Harris, producer, Thomas Bartlett, and Tamar Kali, many more after that. So awesome, Vera, thanks for being here. Uh, next, we have Lenise Bent. She is one of the first women audio engineers, thank you for paving the way, uh, who honed her skills on many iconic records, including Asia by Steely Dan and Breakfast in America by Supertramp. She is the first woman engineer to receive a platinum album for Blondie's Auto American album, which includes The Tide is High, and the very first hit rap song with music, Rapture. Uh, she also works in post-production as an audio professional, specializing in recording and editing Foley sound effects for many films and animated series. She travels the world for a little company known as DreamWorks. <laughs> where she supervises the foreign dialogue. She produces the vocals for films such as Shrek, Spirit Stallion of the Cimarron, as well as Shrek 2. She also archives and repairs audio, instructs and consults for singer-songwriters. Lenise is also a longstanding member of the Audio Engineering Society, the Producers and Engineering Wing of the Recording Academy, and a voting member of the NARAS, she is a proud member of Sound Girls, Women's Audio Mission, Women in Music, the prestigious Hollywood Sapphire Group, the Blues Foundation, the International Association of Sound Archivists, and the Association of Recorded Sound Collectors. She is a very busy woman. Um, though mostly working in digital formats these days, Lenise really, uh, recently produced and engineered an all analog recording with the blues, rock, indie band, Primal Kings, where she recorded to two inch tape, mixing down to half inch, and then they cut that to vinyl. So completely out of the box. So it's awesome to have you here. Thank you so much, Lenise. Next, we have Jasmine Chen. She is a Grammy nominated audio engineer and vocal producer based in LA. After graduating from the University of Texas in Austin, she moved back to LA and began, began interning at the Forecast Recordings while working at IO Music Academy as their partnerships and studio manager. During that time, she also freelanced as a production sound mixer and boom operator on film sets and helped sound design products for music software as well as studio furniture company output. From the IO Music Academy, Jasmine was brought in as an intern for Heavy Duty Studios where she honed her skills as a recording engineer. Now she holds the position as their house engineer and studio manager. Jasmine has worked on projects for AliEx, Verona, Cass McCombs, Claro, Conan Gray, Dove Cameron, Haim, Kelly Clarkson, Madam Gandhi, Snoop Dogg, and so many more. So Jasmine, thank you so much for being here with us today. And we have Crystal Jerez. <laughs> She's an audio engineer uh, who does it all. She does recording, mixing, as well as mastering. After studying audio production at American University, what up DC? That's where she got her graduate. She came here to New York where she studied at New York University for her graduate studies. She started working professionally at Platinum Sound Recordings. And after four years of that, 
She moved on to work as Alex Tumay's mix assistant at Do What Sounds Good Studios in Chelsea. It is there where she worked on records for Party Next Door, Division, Gunna, and many more. Um, she's currently based out of LA and also has a really cool newsletter that I recommend you check out. So thank you so much, Crystal. I am your moderator, Jess Fenton. I'm an audio and mix engineer. Mix engineer. I work uh, on music and podcasts based out of Brooklyn. And I recently released a video series featuring all women working in music production called Proof and Music. So thank you so much to all of our panelists for being here. Let's get into it. What do you think? <laughs> right. That was a lot of reading. I was reading. <laughs> so that out. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't want to like edit. Like you guys do not need to be edited. Okay. So first and foremost, I think we need to start off by defining what in the box and out of the box even means. So first let's define in the box. Um, Vera, would you like to define that for us or your definition? Yeah. So this was actually, so right before we started, I, I was asking Jess about this. I was, I was curious to know if people were thinking about if I think in the box, I think like recording to Pro Tools. And if I think out of the box, I think recording to tape. But because tape is used so rarely these days, I didn't know if for most people, the term might change to mean just using outboard gear versus like doing literally everything inside the box. So I guess, yeah, up until now, I would have thought of it as like out of the box as all analog, we're going to an analog. It really, it really, I would define it as like the recording medium, the tape or the computer. But um, I'd be curious to know what everyone, what everyone else thinks, because if we, even especially for this conversation, define out of the box as using say EQ and compression, that's hardware on the way in to Pro Tools or something that might like frame it differently, but it's not yeah. a direct answer, but that's how I was thinking about it. <laughs> what, what do the rest of you, how would you guys define in the box? Well, uh, I would say in the box, if it's completely in the box, then yes, everything, all activities, including instrumentation, you know, samples, not real music mm. and musical instruments, that's the extreme, that's total in the box. Um, the opposite extreme is out of the box, as you said, analog to tape um, through uh, an analog console, through uh, outboard gear, all of those things. On the other side, totally, um, completely out of the box, no D word, no samples, no... <laughs> Um, ons and offs, and um, then everything in between, uh, recording into Pro Tools through a Neve console, through 1176 outboard gear, whatever, you know, um, and uh, but still recording digitally and then mixing. A lot of the times, you know, it's basically are we mixing in the box and or mixing out of the box? And that would be digital versus analog. I would think it's safe to say. Right. Jasmine, do you have any uh, definitions for us for in the box? Yeah, how you I perceive mean, that, it? That, that summed it up for me. I feel like, you know, with the invention of the Apollo interfaces and, um, and, and I mean, the pre focus Focusrites where you just use the pre's in the interface um, and like with Apollo, you are using plugins to emulate the pre's and whatever that with that unison thing, I think that's really changed um, recording for a lot of people. And that would to me be in the box and out of the box would be just, yeah, to me, it's anything that goes out into another hardware before it gets into your, into your interface until you're into your converter. Um, Cause yeah, in our studio, I'm actually in the studio right now. Um, we like, we record through tape, but it's all going back to digital concurrently with our digital as well. So mm. um, yeah, I feel like out of the box, at least it's just telling anything that <laughs> goes outside of the interface to me, the interface is the box to me. Crystal, what do you think? 
I mean, really what everyone else said, uh, especially what Lenny said, I really never even, sometimes I'll record like out of the box, like into gear, but I never even take into consideration the fact that like, I'm still kind of in the box because I'm eventually recording into Pro Tools, right? So like, I never even consider that in the box now, um, even if I'm using like outboard gear, because it's now it's just like, that's my version of tape. Right. So, um, but like, like, uh, Jasmine said as well, like Apollo that is like recording into the Apollo is in the box. And I've been doing that so much lately just because of like COVID and not being on the go and like limiting my sessions to smaller situations. Now, like I am kind of recording in the box everywhere because of like my Apollo and the traveling situation. Does somebody want to expand on what, what you're talking about when you say Apollo for those who are not totally sure what that means? It's a, it's a, it's a brand name. Well, it's a style. I'll let you take it. <laughs> like a, a, made by like a universal audio. Um, yeah. So universal yeah. audio. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So that's the brand. The Apollo is the interface. The interface. Right. And they have like larger structures with like 16 channels, or you can have something um, as small as just like two channels of like mic, mic ins and line ins. So you can pretty much record anywhere. Um, and it also provides like preamp emulations. So you could um, do things that emulate recording out of the box, but really in the box. I feel like we're talking about which came first, chicken or the egg at this yeah. point. <laughs> okay, good point. So I think you guys basically covered in the box versus out of the box. So I think for the sake of this conversation, we will include tracking to tape as well as touching outboard gear as out of the box. Is that cool? Yeah, I'm seeing thumbs up. <laughs> Love it. Yes. All right, well then let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of going either route. So I think for the sake of conversation, let's keep it pretty streamlined to where, and when I say streamlined, I mean to the extreme, like if we're gonna go entirely in the box, like I'm hooking up a MIDI controller to a focus right into Pro Tools and I'm pulling up a, a VST, or not in Pro Tools, but you know, a plugin, a virtual instrument, like for the sake of conversation, let's say that's our in the box. And then out of the box is like tracking to a, a console, large format console, maybe touching some outboard gear and then going to tape. So what would be some advantages of only recording in the box? Um, Lenise, do you wanna start that? Well. Um, one obvious one is the um, uh, the fact that uh, you can save everything and um, you can recall everything. So um, uh, out of the box, um, that's not necessarily so. And so you have to keep that in mind that if you are going to be recording or mixing using outboard gear or through a console that doesn't have total recall, um, you're going to have to somehow, uh, if you need to get back to that same recording or mix, um, have documentation to be able to get back to those settings and all of that stuff. So, you know, there's a bit of muscle memory going on there where uh, completely in the box, it's, it's, um, it's saved, it's always there, you can recall it. It's, it's very convenient being in the box. Anybody else wanna add? add to that what else is so great about sticking to recording in the box I mean for me it's just convenience like I can yeah it's like pulling I can pull up the same thing every single time which isn't the case with uh, recording out of the box like nothing really ever sounds the same when you're going through like two uh preamps like you can't really uh perfect that every single time and that's like kind of the beauty of recording out of the box um but you can't you can't do that so quickly. And like with the genres I work in being like hip hop and like r and like it's so fast paced that like it's perfect. Like being in the box is perfect for that. And like recalling uh, things on the like, console takes time. And like, uh, that's just like not the environment for the genres I work in. Mm. Vera. I see you shaking your head. Yes. <laughs> I totally. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think that's 
that's the, that's the biggest thing that in the box has to offer is the convenience factor. But there's also like, you know, if you're writing and you're recording MIDI, you can, you can change sounds, which is, you know, which is also a, a convenience, a major convenience. <laughs> um, and, um, and yeah, it's like not only just recording, but it's like, kind of as Crystal was saying, it's like if you're setting up sessions, like you can just duplicate tracks if somebody has their, a lot of like rappers and stuff have like a certain sound dialed into that they already like that they use. And that can be like their EQs and their auto tune and stuff like that. They're just like stylistic tools that you just make a bunch of tracks there and they can jump in at any time. All you need are the plugins. So, so speed. Um, yeah. Speed yeah. being able to, so I would you say that it kind of which method you go kind of lends itself to the genre that you're working on. Jasmine, what do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I also work in also hip hop and also like indie uh, or just rock too. And um, I mean, part of in the box is that you, you can make mistakes and easily correct it. Um, you don't have to redo the whole thing. And um, you know, you'll, you'll, you can very easily um, fix or mitigate any phasing, any mm. latency issues without having to sit around and try to calculate and and do extra things that you can't just like do with a button and, and Pro Tools. So that's a huge plus. And um, yeah, even even going through analog tape, you never know when something will 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 somehow have a weird sound where like oh, there's a bleed from the previous take, and then it's just you have to do that takeover again or something just isn't usable or you have to get RX7, which is then going <laughs> back in this box to fix analog issues or out of the box issues. <laughs> right. Well, so, um, yeah, I, nice. I would like to uh, <laughs> defend <laughs> oh. <laughs> analog recording a little bit. I, it's, yeah, please. I'm, I'm feeling that this is all kind of stilting towards no, um, let's you know, talk, staying talk in the box the and yeah. And um, um, as far as I'm concerned, I, I I think it's safe to say I've probably had more um, experience out of the box than everybody because that's all there was when I started. And um, so I'm very comfortable um, recording that way. And it's a certain style of recording, um, which um, insists that you make commitments and you make decisions and you mm -hmm. stick to them. And... Um, the positive aspects of that for me is that uh, the energy is is captured and actually I, I work very fast uh, to tape um, because um, we have to make decisions because you can only it's finite and, it, and it's and it's destructive audio, which is kind of a rush um, for me to me it's. Uh, it's more like an, an art. It's um, uh, playing the tape machine, playing the console, uh, all of that. It's Those are the instruments that I play, uh, more so than typing and looking at a monitor and just pushing buttons and, and things like that. Uh, you know, I love the convenience. I do that all the time. And God would be, especially in post-production. Um, when I started in post, it was, to tape and um, for dialogue and sound design and all of that, boy, um, you know, Pro Tools was just heaven. Um, however, when it comes to music, and it is, I think, uh, genre specific, or that will dictate what is makes more sense recording out of the box than in the box. Um, this record that I did, here, shameless promotion, Primal Kings, 100% um, analog, uh, because that was what the band wanted to do. And so they called me out to, to produce and engineer that because I had those skills, but the, it's a different style. Um, it's, a, it's a rock band, it's a rock blues indie, you know, power band and uh so it was a lot of fun to record we recorded everybody in the same room we rehearsed mm -hmm. so there's a lot of pre-production not a lot but you know um 
they we rehearsed so we knew when we went in the studio what we were going to do and my job basically was to um uh, inspire and capture performances and that's what I did to tape. And so the energy and that vibe and all of that is boom, right there. Some of them are first takes. The singer is a great singer, you know, one take wonder. So um, all of these things are in place. You know, I didn't have to auto tune and didn't have to melody didn't have to move anything around. It was all boom, you know, spot on. And so it's more about uh, me at that point the instrument that I'm playing, they're all out there playing their instruments. I'm playing the console and the tape machine and, and the, you know, the limiter and the compressor or whatever I'm using, which is minimal because I'm also playing the microphones and um, making sure I have the right mics in the right place because I prefer not to use any EQ when I, when I capture a performance, mm -hmm. if I can. Um, and, and that's basically all the time. So when I mix, I have all frequencies available to me, you know, because as we know, if you add EQ here, it takes it away from somewhere else. And so I don't want that. You know, my goal as uh, an engineer, which makes it interesting and artistic for me, is to create the sound and capture, capture that sound uh, initially. And so I don't have to manipulate it. If I, you know, the, the less I have to manipulate it, the purer the sound is. And again, that um, doesn't matter for, you know, a lot of things. In fact, what you want for certain styles, hip hop and EDM and whatever, you know, uh, a certain amount of manipulation is the, you know, popular sound right now. And so um, that's part of it. And, other cases, and especially if you're re recording an orchestra, if you're recording a string quartet, if you're recording um, a bluegrass band, um, you know, if you're getting into these different genres, the um, the authenticity of the instrumentation and the group playing together, that's what you want to capture the best way you can. So um, recording to tape in, in that respect and when I record digitally, I record with the same mindset as I do recording to tape. I make decisions. I don't want 20 tracks or something. I want to capture the performance. To me, it's about the performance. And, and so um, whether I'm in the box or out of the box, that's, that's in place as well. So, so what uh, about, you know, people, people often talk about that magic word of warmth, the warmth, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Right. Is that, well, is that not a part of, of why you'd want to go out of the box? I mean, we'll get into plugins versus actual gear here in a minute. Um, but, you know, genre wise, doesn't that kind of play a role in, in the vibe that you're going for? Like, wouldn't you get oh, a, a true authentic warmth if you went into a console? Well, a yeah. Outboard yeah. gear. I mean, it, absolutely. That consoles have their own sounds. You know, that's why, you know, I'm a Neve girl. Uh, some people are SSL girls. Some people, you know, um, there's cool. a, a variety. And so you get used to that. That's the instrument you play when it comes to outboard gear and and um, consoles and monitors and and microphones and and yeah, the warmth, because again, now this is getting back to digital and analog. Um, Analog has all frequencies and harmonics and everything. It's a sample rate of one to one. Nothing is missing. Where anything digital is a series of ones and zeros, ons and offs. And so basically for every one, for every on, there's an off. And uh, so half the information is actually missing. Even though the faster the sample rates, the closer they are together, it's still 50% of it's not there. So a lot of that is what is what you call the warmth. Every every har harmonic, secondary and tertiary, everything is represented in a sample rate of one to one, which is analog That's right now. And once digital, we have the technology. They just haven't, you know, it's not marketable yet. They don't want to do it. 
but they can because we have the storage space and all of that. But uh, once it gets to a sample rate of one to one, where the and you know one great big huge sample of you know a file, then um, then it'll be comparable, I think. So then, what would be like on the flip side? Unless anybody wants to add to that, <laughs> like the. Um... I guess I want to, oh. yeah, sorry. <laughs> well, I just was going to say like, even like warmth, right? Uh, Cause that's obviously like a common, uh, everyone gets like when mixing, like I'd love this to sound warm and it's like we recorded it all like digitally, right? But I always think of like the first point in the process is the microphone. And even though I might be recording into an Apollo, um, like right now I've been doing a bunch of like, like let's writing camps. So like I'm in like these little production rooms where I just have like an Apollo, but the microphone locker is like infinite. So I'm like, all right, let's, how can I add this warmth even though I'm going to be going like strictly in the box and into my laptop. Um, so it's like tube mics or even like, there's some warmth that like isn't even there, but like in my head is there when I'm like giving um, the vocalist a handheld microphone and like I just like turn the lights off and they're just kind of like in the zone holding it and doing like these scratch vocals um like into like a Sennheiser like 421 there's like a certain cap like sound that's captured that's not there when they're just strictly like sitting into like and singing into it like maybe seven um so like I I try to like add warmth as much as I can even though I'm going in the box through those little decisions um, so that's, I don't, that's just like one way I'd like to add warmth if I'm still going in the box. But Vera, you're going to say something. No, that was so great. I was just, I was like thinking about that. Um, I, yeah, what I was thinking of was when you do it all analog, it's like the whole intention of how you track changes, like your prep for it changes, your planning. So your planning changes, the, the, how you perform changes like you know when you're just when you're just in the box it's like you can record 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 when you have to stop tape and like rewind say you're doing you know say you run out of tape or you have to just wait a minute you have to reset anything I feel like the the artists the musicians um having that pause also does something to the performance um <laughs> yeah Jasmine knows what I'm talking about and um and, and so, yeah, and so I like, yes, I think that we all, we all get that. And the last thing I'll say is that my performance changes too, because I'm listening so much more intently because I don't have a screen I'm looking at. Like it's not up to the screen, I'm looking at meters and I'm listening. And that changes everything about how I'm doing my job. And as Lenny said, playing my instrument. So agree. Yeah. So agree. <laughs> it becomes a, well, oral thing and also with tape when that that space when you're rolling back um you listen to that you can hear your balance you can you the 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 reverse playback uh, is a very important aspect of how you're recording you know how is your balances and your sounds are so that's part of it too and um yeah, as far as vocals and all of that goes, um, you can still be very fast. I use, again, I use that same concept of recording in the box as out of the box because one, uh, I make commitments and go fast because I have a budget. If I, just because I can record over and over, that takes time. And this is something I, I wanna make money at and I wanna make sure that the, the artist or the band that, their, their budget, we stay within that. And uh, hopefully there'll be a little left over and we get it done, you know, um, before the deadline. So um, just that's, that was the big issue that I saw. Uh, two of the things about recording out of the box uh, in the style that it, it provides you with that you can do, you know, 20, 30, takes and then comp it later um that all takes time that takes a lot of time and and the more uh, energy i find that the energy drops if you go more than uh three or four takes on on a vocal to me for a real vocalist you could you just feel the energy change and um 
what Crystal said before, you know, doing the demos and the handheld mic, I always assume every take and everything I record is the potential final take, because sometimes that performance in that demo, you're never going to beat it because the energy is right. They're comfortable. The lighting, as you said, whatever's going on, if I don't want that to go away because I just assumed it was a demo and not going to be a final project. So often that has been the case. So um, again, uh, I the, the uh, convenience and the wonderful thing about digital and in the box is fantastic. And those are just added to the style of recording and committing and capturing and keeping energy up and staying within budget budgets <laughs> so let's let's talk about let's say we have some budgets let's let's put this into perspective of of like most of us we're working from home we always kind of did that the diy folks studios are shutting down so for people who want to get into uh using outboard gear or say they want to buy a console or like an api like who knows what would be, what, let me just read the question. <laughs> There's submitted questions that I need to just read them. Um, what outboard gear would you recommend starting out with if you've never owned out gear, outboard gear before? So how would you get started? Say, say someone's like, I'm loving this outboard idea. What would you recommend to them as far as integrating that into their studios? Um, Crystal? I feel like it's dependent on what they're recording the most. Um, so if you're like recording instruments, then like, I, I don't know, if you're recording instruments, then I would have to think of like, uh, what preamp would serve that better than a preamp for a vocalist. Um, so I think it's just dependent on what like, the, I always see myself serving the music that I record and like, like that's the goal is to capture the performance as best as I can. So whatever you're working on, I would research like what's best for that. Is it a preamp? Is it an EQ um, compressors? Like, yeah, I don't know if anyone has comments on that. It's not very helpful. Anybody else want to add to that? How, how does one decide, you know, okay, so I want to try, I want to try a, you know, a, a compressor. How does one be even begin to Google that? Like compressor for a beginner. Like did, what, what advice would you have for someone who is ready to drop some money on a piece of gear? I would say like, I mean, a lot of people have turned to warm audio. I'm like, I'm, I'm just going to go straight to like specific names. Yeah. Um, but I mean, classic things that, like, I mean, to see what everyone is using the most popular products there's a reason they are popular and a lot of times you know you can't just drop three or four k on a u87 just because everyone's saying that's the most commonly um used mics or like the most um not universal but like you know it it's it's bound to not sound completely horrible if you have <laughs> um the right treatment the right space and a good preamp um but i would just say if you have saved enough for like an average um, budget for uh, hardware gear because you know they go in the thousands oftentimes and if you even have just an SM7 um, something that I worked with recently was the Universe Audio 6176 it's a tube uh, channel strip hardware and it has the their 610 uh, tube preamp and then a little tiny 1176 LN compressor and it's like you're having your solid preamp and a compressor in one um, for the same price as the U87. So um, I, I would recommend that just because I recently uh, I recently just did a just even a guitar on it and I didn't even like I barely touched the compressor and just sound great. I used on another like uh, just a vocal and I'm like, oh, well, cool, this sounds great. It was with the U87, but <laughs> then um, it was like a DIY setup in a slightly treated space. And I was actually just, yeah, it, I was impressed by how far it went. Um, but I do hear a lot of people have used like warm audio um, rep replicas. I'm, I haven't English in a while 
just been staring at computers all day. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, they ha oh emulations. There we go. Um, there are some good uh, budget emulations out there, and I think they're worth a shot at least to get, um, you know, just to get your footing on on using hardware and seeing how, you know, knobs interact with the sound that you're hearing from it. Um, but you know, they also say it is quite important to get a pretty decent converter with your hardware, your analog gear, so that like Luis uh, um, mentioned earlier, like Lenny's, um, that you know, you're getting as much of the information from the analog gear into your computer. So your converter for those wondering what, what that means is just our interface. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. You know, like depending on, so if someone goes out and buys a warm audio uh, 1176 replica, um, or emulator emulation. Huh, what? <laughs> there you go. Same. I can't talk. <laughs> what happened? Um, emulation. Uh, so yeah, WA seventy six. You know what? Does it matter? What would be a comparable interface if they say you know they start they had like a inbox and they're ready to go up go up the next level? Any recommendations like a Focusrite Claret or a, you know, again, it probably depends on what you're recording. How many ins do you need? Do you need a MIDI function? How many yep. headphones? Like, Vera, what's up? What do you think? Uh, the headphones are really important, really good headphones. And um, because you want an accurate representation of what you're actually hearing. So you don't want anything hyped. You don't want... Uh, well, mostly that you want a flat response because you want to be able to know that whatever you're recording is actually what you're really hearing. So anything that's got, you know, beats, beats is not a professional format. So if, if you, if you have beats, um, those, those aren't good. Um, if you're, if you want to be a professional, because you want this to translate wherever you take this, you know, you may want to do some of your work in your own um, home studio. I do that all the time and we all do. And, but perhaps, you know, you need to take it to somebody else's or you're going to mix somewhere else or whatever. It's got to translate. So mm -hmm. really accurate headphones are very good. Um, I recommend the uh, Audio-Technica. Um, in, I have M50 X's that I've had for ages and yeah. <laughs> uh, really is that what you've got yeah. to crystal how how many of us have uh, audio technica m50x's yeah. um those are those are great and they translate all over the place so that's really important excellent preamp like you said um uh i would um uh, if you actually want to start building up outboard gear I would uh, go to a studio that has it or go to, um, I don't know, Vintage King, or if you, if you can, I know not everybody has good audio stores around, but uh, do your research and listen and listen to the differences in, in what works for what it is that you're going to do. Um, critical listening, um, I think knowing what you want to do with the equipment, because you can you can have a wonderful uh, LA two A and or um, you know uh, a Fairchild or something like that, but if you don't know how to use it, it's going to sound like crap. And so learn how to use your your gear, whether it's an emulation and a, a plugin or an actual piece of outboard gear. Know what it is you're doing. Know your your signal flow. Know your gain structures. All those sort of things. Learning proper recording techniques makes um, almost any piece of gear much more valuable because you can take uh, one of the earliest things I learned was um, you know with an you can just take a, a a 57 microphone and if it's in the right hands in the uh, Right and by, well, you just move around till it sounds right. You make you make that thing work. You know, whatever you have, you work with what you have. And uh, but if you know how to use things and what it is you want to do with them, you'll have much greater success. It's yeah. not about the gear it, itself so much. It's about how you know how to use it. Um, I would recommend 
for someone who on a smaller budget and just trying to learn this out, one of the questions in the chat is like how to start learning to record to analog. This isn't necessarily recording analog, but I um, started purchasing guitar pedals and would use like send out uh, tracks from Pro Tools into these guitar pedals and like played around with delay and distortion, um, reverbs, and it was such a easy budget friendly way uh to just play around and get familiar with like settings and going into like a hybrid setup and it's like also really easy to travel with just like a little a little guitar pedal and um yeah i would really recommend that to someone who wanted to like start learning that's awesome that's oh, a wow. great yeah sorry go ahead oh. yeah jasmine go ahead oh i was just saying um the way i actually forgot to mention that the way that I actually got to learn so I'm in the and like here's my cute little VCM the way I got to learn how to use this was just like using the plug-in emulations for 1073 and and seeing how just like yeah I I learned mostly off of plugins and seeing all the popular plug-in emulations of hardware and um then being able to touch the actual analog gear in person I'm just like whoa there's a huge difference and there is you know nothing quite like trying an EQ on an actual channel strip uh, versus in the plugin, but that's a great way to get your bearings um, and just study something digitally first before you go into hardware. I love that. So that's that's going to be my next question. Well, one that was submitted is, is being honest, how do the plugins compare to the actual gear that they're emulating? You know, you've got like the Manly Vox box. That is, a, as Vera has said to me before, it's this incredible piece of gear. And there's also a plug-in version and you've got, you know, the distressor and then now there's recently a plug-in version. Honestly, how do they compare? What do you think? I would, I'd love to jump in. I feel like the first thing at the top of my mind is that like, you know, there's certain, there's certain pieces of gear like LA-2As or 1176s or Poltex in particular, where like each unit can have its own character and can react a little bit differently. And so you kind of like, I feel like part of being in a, in a new studio and using that stuff is like learning, learning how they react. And then you start, if you get to spend enough time in a certain room with certain gear, you start to choose it for different applications. Um, even like like Lunice was touching on this before, how every desk sounds different. You know, um, at Electric Lady, we had two U47s and they were from around the same time, but we called one Thelma and one Louise and we use them for very different things. <laughs> like one was brighter, one was darker. One, yeah, it's, it's just like different. Um, so I feel like in that sense, um, they've the plugins have come a long way and some of them react or, or like getting better it's like it's all about how they like re especially compressors how they react I think um and some of them have come a long way and sound a lot better but I I oftentimes feel like I still prefer outboard compressors and you I don't really use them while mixing right I still mix in the box and everything but like um I'll definitely use them tracking which is something that developed over time but um I, yeah, I just find that that analog gear, you, you find the character of each one and, and plugins, it's always going to be the same thing. Mm. Anybody else? Everybody, we're all shaking our heads like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to continue to just move on to some of these questions. We've had some come in while we started this. Um, let's see. Are there any, do you, do you have any specific tips or things to look out for when recording vocals at home? Anything specific, uh, Crystal recommended? Let's see, I'm just reading this question. Uh, holding a mic while recording to try and get more warmth and capturing something different when recording vocals. What are your favorite tips for recording vocals in a home studio? Um, Lenny's, <laughs> go for it. I think you're still on mute. <laughs> We all do it. 
Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Um, the first thing I would say about that, it depends on the vocalist and how much experience they have recording and what their mic technique is. Um, whether you're in the studio or at home, um, it, if that person, like um, Bono loves just all his vocals are handheld in a, a 58 and he does them in the control room. Um, and most of the vocalists that I work with, um, I will start out sometimes with them out in the in the room and they always say, can I come in and sing in there with you? And they'll be sure, okay. And especially if I'm running the Pro Tools because I can, you know, I can produce them very intimately in the same room. And so that's a very good thing. I would say to, uh, you should have a screen um, and to eliminate as much of the room as possible when you're doing a vocal, because you can always add any uh, ambiences and the manipulations later. They get the purest sound you can and, and um, not necessarily dead. It just depends on your environment. But if you mm -hmm. have uh, don't have an optimum environment in your home, one of those vocal screens is really good. And by SE or you can even make them. They have them, uh, you know, how to do it online and save you a bunch of money. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I saw the list of questions and I just wrote down like clean signal, like clean room. Like it's just the most important, especially right now. All the mixes I've been getting have been like recorded at home to like mix. And it's a lot of like uh, background noise and or just like noise from um, the interface, like maybe like the game is like way too loud. So all I hear is just like uh, the noise score. So uh, looking out for that. And so by the room, by saying the room, what we mean is like reflections, echoes, sounds mm -hmm. bouncing all around. So if any, if you guys have the option to, and then when I say you guys, I mean the viewers, deaden the reflections, absorb the reflections, then, then do it. And that can be, you know, buying really nice panels from like GIK acoustics or building your own or leaning a mattress against the wall, anything that's gonna stop the sound from going berserk. Your, your uh, clothes closet is wonderful because your yes. clothes can, can <laughs> absorb in all different ways. And that's what you want because uh, acoustic, you want a, a optimum acoustic environment. So um, that's either the reflection absorption or, or a diversion of the sound. And so for vocals, you want it to be absorbed. You don't want reflection and you don't want diversion. You want absorption. And um, so, yeah, you can create that. I mean, I've, I've recorded people in their bedrooms and, and even in their closets and, you know, I'm hearing stuff and I pulled the comforter off their bed and hang it, you know, whatever. I just start creating a sound a vocal booth for them. And um, because the, the beauty of that is when you do get that clean recording and say you, you don't have all the outboard gear, once you have that clean signal going in and that crisp vocal, then you can add your tape emulation after that, right? Like then you can really start to shape the sound with those plugins um, that we talked about before. You know, Pro Tools comes with the 1176 uh, stock plugin. I think it still does, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's, or you can get the, you know, the Waves SSL channel, you know, and do it after, after the fact. So the, the, the cleaner and stronger the vocal is coming in, the more I think effective it is when you apply those effects after the fact. I think. And, well, and also a very important thing is, um, if the singer is liking how they're sounding in their headphones, which they're going to like better their environment, the better performance you're going to get out of them. And it's all about the performance. I mean, you don't want to have to sit there and think about how uh, insufficient your recording environment is. It's not about that. You want to make sure that you get the best vocal possible. And that's, that's hard enough right there. <laughs> yeah, I think that's so overlooked is like, I always tell like my, the new assistants and new interns, like check their head, like the singer's headphones first, because 
what they're hearing. If any slight like latency, like if they can't hear themselves too well, it just throws off the entire performance and they like start overthinking things. So like the headphones are so overlooked in the recording process, but I would like super recommend listening first before the singer even touches the microphone. Oh God, yeah, the cue mix is absolutely essential to successful recording, whether it's a, an individual or a band. Um, if they like how they sound in their phones, they're going to get into the music and um, you get a much better result. Agreed. Yeah. <laughs> so here's, here's an interesting question, and I'm quoting the question. I've heard that ribbon mics work better for digital recording than for analog tape. What do you think about that? Lenice, you're shaking your head, Lenice. <laughs> <laughs> ribbon mics work great for both. Okay, there we hear. It. Yeah, Vera, what do you think? I, I was I saw that question and I was wondering it. I was wondering why someone would think <laughs> that. But I <laughs> yeah, sorry, what? What? Kind never, of, you wow. never know. Like, but you so know much. What I, I, I thought maybe it was that you know a lot of ribbon mics you have to like really crank the gain on them, and I thought maybe it was like a noise floor thing with tape versus ribbon mic gain. I don't know. I just was like I really. It got, it got me. I was curious, maybe I was going to learn something new today by that question, but yeah, I think we were all on the same page. <laughs> they sound great, though, the ribbon mics. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're just a figure eight. They're just, you know, vibrating ribbon. And yeah, they don't have a lot of game, but boy, they sound good regardless. You know, it, it's about capturing that sound again. You know, that's what it's about, digital or analog. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's another question. Would you rather have a plug-in software incompatibility incompat issue? Or would you rather deal with an analog gear maintenance issue? Jasmine, what do you think? Software incompatibility. <laughs> it's a lot less expensive. <laughs> There's other alternatives that you could use. True. Sure. Well, it Anybody depends else? on how much outboard gear you have. If you've got four 1176s and right. one goes down, you just plug into another one. So, right. you know, <laughs> it depends. <laughs> it's all about balance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's do another question. Um, so what are some accessible ways to get experience working out of the box? And I guess this may, like, means if, if you're not gonna buy some pieces of your own, do you have any recommendations on how one might get experience using that gear? Uh, Crystal? Uh, either, I mean, my experience was like being in the studio and like as an intern or an assistant when I first started out um, using, depending on the studio, I was like able to use the gear during like off hours, right? Um, so then, like after sessions, I would just bring in my own things and like run everything through that. Uh, I learned what I liked, what I didn't like. I learned what didn't work at the studio and what did work, which is like really important. Um, and like uh, Vera said, I learned like which version, like we had to use 67s, which one sounded better on the piano and Honey Bunny sounded great on vocals. Like uh, those little things, um, if you don't intern or like assist, just booking maybe a few hours at the studio and doing uh, even a month and just like doing some mixing sessions there um, or bringing a vocalist with you that like, hey, I can offer a free recording session and a few let me experiment on your vocal as well. I like try to run things through um, different compressors and EQs. Yeah, so I mean, in all honesty, is getting an inter internship at a studio really an option these days? I think, I think every studio is still running. Yeah. It is, but it's <laughs> difficult if you're not a student um, because of so many of the big studios, they have relationships with the recording programs at different universities throughout the world. And so, uh, and a lot of those programs um, require the student to have a two month internship as part of their graduation requirements. So there's a relationship like that there. Um, so quite often, I mean, if you're a student, you have a better chance, but also this is where networking comes in. This is where, you know, all those organizations I belong to, um, 
I have friends, you know, in all of them, and they all do different things. And um, because of that, I have connections and relationships with people. And um, I highly recommend that being your one of your greatest tools to achieving any kind of goal in this industry. It's, it's who you know, and who knows you. And you can call them up and say, wow, you know, somebody said that those old DBX 160 limiters are really good on female vocals. And I hear you've got some, do you have any time where I could just come in and check something out? And they'll say, oh yeah, nobody's in there, right? You know, tomorrow night, come in. Come in. And if you've established those relationships, you can, <laughs> you can ask those things and, and try them out. And, um, but it's because you know somebody who wants to help you. And especially for um, up and coming engineers, um, people like myself who do mentoring and all of that at this point, you know, we give back a lot. And, um, and I'm sure all of you too, when you come across a, a young sound girl who is enthusiastic and shows promise, don't you want to give back to her and show her stuff? Yeah. Totally. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Um, speaking of that, Lenise, uh, a question came in that says, can you ask Lenise about bringing more women into fraternal organizations such as the Hollywood Sapphire Group to bring continued diversity? So absolutely. Well, reach out. Reach out. You know, yeah, let me know, especially right now. One of the coolest things about this lockdown, I mean, there's been a lot of blessings here, I have to tell you, you know, um, you know, lack of work isn't typically one of them, but, um, but the fact that uh, everything is virtual, that you don't have to be in and go to a specific location, Hollywood Sapphire Group, when we're not in lockdown, which is uh, uh, invitation only audio. It's real geek oriented. <laughs> you have to be a real geek to appreciate it. But um, uh, you get invited and then you get, uh, you, you go to this restaurant in this place and you uh, network and, and interact with each other. And it's a great support group. Virtually, you can be anywhere in the world and go to Hollywood Sapphire and be invited as a guest. You won't, don't have quite the networking capabilities because there's not you know, one-on-one face-to-face people. However, you can be introduced by whoever you've asked, can you bring me as a guest? And this is what you can do. And um, for, uh, I highly recommend joining the Audio Engineering Society. I highly recommend, um, any um well sound girls is great uh, women's audio mission is great any of these areas um that you're interested in reach out to somebody that you know who's there and, and ask them um how can i join or how can i be a guest and that's what you do networking just reach out just go for it reach out i don't know you're i don't know you're there wanting to go you have to let point. me know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Uh, let's get on to some of these other questions. Some of these are a little bit more general, but I think we should still address them. Uh, so what was the one mistake that taught you the most? Um, Jasmine, <laughs> tell us about a mistake that you made that taught you the most. If there was um. one. God, there were so many, <laughs> at least for me. Um, Ouch. Well, for sure, it's, it's for me personally, it's a boundaries thing. And I know, I know from talking to a lot of my female peers that like uh, communicating your boundaries and also respecting other people's boundaries when you don't have many boundaries for yourself, um, you know, it will deteriorate your mental health. It will deteriorate your physical health sometimes too. And um yeah to you know communicate to people that I need more of a heads up or I need certain kinds of communication um for them so that I could be in better service to them instead of me looking really dumb by fearing 
to say like for, for being scared to say that I don't know something or to be scared to say that like I don't understand fully what you mean um that that taught me the most I thought that like I had to know everything coming into a session and and you know being able to be like the best person out there for people but no like nobody knows everything and we have to just communicate that um and if you know if things are not okay you just have to communicate that otherwise it it like whenever I didn't it ate away at me so that was that was the big uh one for me and it helped me be a better engineer be a better person um by not fearing to fail love it anybody mm -hmm. else want to share their a, a giant mistake that taught you the most to put you on the spot <laughs> yeah Lenise. Well, uh, I wouldn't say it's a giant mistake. It was just something that wasn't available to me um, or wasn't encouraged when I started out and I had to do this on my own is become a lot more technical and, um, you know, maintenance oriented and learn electronics and, and all of that. Um, we had maintenance departments in studios. There weren't home studios <laughs> then. And uh, big studios had maintenance departments. And the last thing they wanted was any of the newbies or the assistants to touch anything. We weren't allowed to solder. We weren't allowed to try to fix anything. You had to call a maintenance engineer. And um, as a result, I'm, I don't know how to do a whole bunch of stuff that you guys already know how to do that you're learning and I would say really learn that you'll be much more valuable to yourself in the entire industry cool all right are there any tips that uh any of you swear by that you learned the hard way just kind of kind of similar to the last question but that's uh one of the questions that came in any or do you have any tips that you swear by that you've learned the hard way Vera. <laughs> um, I was just thinking about how when I started tracking and using outboard gear and that and I wouldn't um, I was like scared to use compression because I was worried I wasn't doing it right. But then, you know, you have distorted vocals in a track and then no one's happy about that. So like the main reason to use it is is that if some, you know, they a vocalist can have such a range. So if they go really loud for a second, um, then uh, then yeah, you could be screwed and, and no one's really excited. So that was that was a big one for me. But some people don't like to use it. That's why I, I wasn't sure if I should <laughs> chime in. Crystal, do you have any uh, any tips that you uh, swear by? And I, it's a general question, so. It's yeah, like... I'd say save a version of everything. Because um, mm -hmm. a lot of times, like uh, Lenny said at the beginning, people like the first take. Um, so I like, I record everything, even when they're like, oh, I'm just listening back. I still record because they hum along or they do a harmony they like, and I'm like, save like everything because there's, when you can't, again, then that's the beauty of digital, right? Um, so when I can, I like try to save everything and, uh, label it nicely and like make no mental notes while I'm recording about like, which tracks sounded good, which playlists. Um, I prefer just because it makes like comping so much easier and yeah. Awesome. So was, uh, what is an area that proved to be a challenge for each of you while you were honing your engineering craft? Uh, Lenise. What was the challenge? Um, well, um, getting the experience because uh, you can learn the basic recording techniques, applying those uh, techniques and and, um, uh, you know, fine tuning your skills. It's an acquired skill and it's a, it's an art and a science and a skill. And all of these things have to be practiced. And so to get um, enough practice time in there and to uh, use these techniques and to learn them. And that's, that's the most important thing because you don't just come out of, you know, watch a YouTube, um, you know, tutorial or come out of recording school, the one thing you're going to learn is how much you don't know. And mm -hmm. the more you do it, the, the better you get. And we're always learning. So um, that's, that's a very important thing. 
Okay. Um, what's something you wish you could change about this industry and something that you hope never changes? Make more money. Like the old days. <laughs> May it not die. Yeah. Uh, Vera, what do you think? Yeah. Not that one. Um, no. Also, also, I think the, um, you know, it's an interesting job because the 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 chain of like like the economics of it it's like it's really difficult right so then when you pair that with people kind of expecting things like last like you know they want to book you last minute and they want it right away and they need it to be perfect even though they might not pull their weight on that's on their side and things like that I, I feel like this like kind of insane expectation I wish that would change you know, I wish that there would be like a little bit more normalization of, and I think it's happening, but just more normalization of like, we're humans, we need to eat, we need to see the sun and we need to sleep. And like, we need, you know, and we need to treat each other nicely. Um, the thing I, that kind of goes hand in hand that I don't want to, that I wouldn't want to change is that, you know, it's a, it's an industry of like really crazy loopy out there people. And I love that. Like, <laughs> I love that. Um, and it's a, you know, it's, it's my tribe. It's the tribe. I, I see other people doing other jobs and I'm like, oh, mine is not like yours. <laughs> you know, like, I don't interact with people the same way that you do. So I like that. Great. I would recommend, um, to have a long career is what you want, not a hit career. If you want to do this for a long time, um, there are certain things you need to have in place. And one of them I highly recommend is save money. Mm. You, you earn some money, put some away, start investing it, start planning for later because we have no union um, as far as mu uh, music recording engineers. None of those benefits exist. You have to create them for yourself and start early and just know that. Um, I know... Uh, early on you think you're immortal and bulletproof and you're not and the industry is not it's changed dramatically um i'm still at this time i made more money when i was 27 and 28 and 26 than uh, i've ever made since <laughs> and um that and that was a long time ago so in today's dollars it'd be a whole bunch of money um <laughs> those budgets aren't there anymore things changed and i didn't see that coming so um you know um, prepare for a future and um financially just really really keep that in mind um that's really important so how do you guys keep motivated during these rough times oh <laughs> um i wrote i wrote down like i've definitely limited who I've been working with obviously because of like the pandemic but now it's like I'm way more selective on like the artists and the projects I'm working with not even just because of uh like health and safety reasons but like for like my own mental health like there's certain uh clients that take away so much energy and then by like the end of the day I don't even want to work on any other projects so I've definitely become like way more selective um and then I can enjoy the music I work on and that like I'm excited to work on it the next day or like I'm excited to go record these songs rather than like, oh, I have this session from like 12 to 12, like, oh boy, like there's a difference, right? Um, when you actually enjoy the company that you keep around and the clients that you keep around. Okay. That kind of goes hand in hand with what Jasmine was saying with boundaries, like kind of know your boundaries. Vera mm -hmm. saying, be nice, to, be nice to each other <laughs> and see the sun, allow yourself to, to go outside and not trap yourself in a room for 12 hours because somebody wants it right now. I'm with you. I'm, I'm seeing the trend here. I like it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's an unnecessary oh. sense of urgency that like, hopefully it goes away and I think it is going away, but it does like really hurt your mental health when everyone's like, I need this yesterday. I saw something. Well, also... <laughs> I was just, just going to really piggyback on what. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jasmine. 
Go ahead, Just a really quick thing. It was a, I just saw on the internet, it was a great reminder. Someone else's urgency is not your emergency, especially in the work world. Nice. That, always, that helps me a lot. <laughs> Oh, I'm going to needle t -shirt that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Coming your way soon. That's fantastic. What, what I was going to say is piggybacking on what Jasmine said about boundaries. Coming in, uh, one of the um, big lessons a lot of new engineers um, learn is when as they're starting out and they say, yeah, I can, for $500, I'll, you know, I'll do, um, four tunes for you i'll record them for you and uh and so what happens then is that there's there's no limit on to how much time that's going to take so um you have to be clear on saying for um for 500 dollars, you know you hear a band play or you hear somebody and you i want to do your songs um i can do this for you. I can give you uh, eight hours of the song for five hundred dollars, and with that time, anything over that will be an hourly rate. But for this flat rate, you know, I can do this for you, and know that you can do that. And because otherwise, if you say, "Okay, for five hundred dollars, I'll do your song," then they keep coming back to you saying, "Well, can you tweak this, or can you? I want to add this, or whatever," and you end up, you know, you haven't made any money. We, the whole point is to make a living doing this, so you can afford to do it, and and afford doing that thing that you enjoy doing. But having those boundaries and being clear on those, and um. So the, the artist knows ahead of time and get these established before you go in and start working. Because if you don't have a, a deal, memo, at least the deal memo, you know, if you're not doing a contract with a, a studio or something and an independent one-on-one -on -one project, at least have a deal memo that both of you agree to. So when you're recording, you don't have to think about that. You already know that's in place. You don't have to wonder, gee, am I gonna get paid? Like one of the things for me, I established very early on uh, is that I get paid every day when I'm in the studio with somebody, whether we're um, doing an album or whatever, I get paid every day because if they bail on me, I don't have to chase money hmm. and it's done, you know, that, that uh, and they know that uh, the end of the night, they give me a check or they you know somehow and you never want to give them any of your files or anything like that because that's that's the only leverage you have so um keep those to yourself so you can guarantee that you will get paid if they want those then they have to pay you but i get paid every night because i'm lazy i don't want to have to think about it and you deserve it well, yes, everybody deserves true. it. That true. you know, that's a real easy agreement to make. And if they want you, and I also get a retainer when somebody says, "I want you to do my project or whatever like that," then I say, "Great, okay." Um, you know, show me you mean it, and give mm -hmm. me a retainer because you have to do pre-production. You have to, you know whatever it is you need to do if you're booking a studio or you're doing it yourself or whatever, there are things that you have to do to prepare to record that thing. That takes time. You know, if they want to have, you know, um, on a project, it's always really good to have guest um, performers on it. So you can have that credit. That's mm -hmm. why you do that. So if people don't know you, at least they know them. So they with, wow, if, that, if Beyonce sang on, on this and I must like, you know, I'm going to listen to it, uh, whatever that is. So, you know, all these little things, you have to make arrangements for that. You have to spend time doing that. You have to spend time on the clock. The artist calls you and they want to talk. And I say, great, you know, clock's ticking, let's go. And I let them know that, you know, my time is valuable. If you want to talk for an hour about whatever, cool. It's... <laughs> Here, here's my it. invoice yeah <laughs> um but get a retainer so you know that they mean it it's just they're just not playing with you and that they're not going to rip you off um Love ask it. me how i know know to do that <laughs> Yeah. That's another conversation. <laughs> yes, exactly. But you want to avoid that. Yeah, These are you. ways to avoid that. Yeah. So this is an interesting question that I, I'm curious about too, is this is at what time in your careers did you start implementing outboard gear? 
Um, Jasmine, do you want to start? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I think the first studio that I interned at, um, and this was after I graduated college, um, that's where I like really, really got in hands on. Um, and that was at Forecast. And I, I did have a class where I got to use my professor's um, like outboard gear, but then like didn't really let us use it. <laughs> didn't really let us touch it. Um, Cause you know, half the time we just didn't know. And also it's just, you know, tricky um, when it's, it's someone's personal property. But um, yeah, I mean, this current studio that I'm at, um, Heavy Duty, I, this was my first time working with a tape machine. We have this ginormous uh, 16 track Scully tape machine <laughs> um, and an Ampex. And, um, and uh, that was like, yeah, it took me like three more years outside of college for me to finally like work with this really expensive gear that I could not have access to otherwise. So, you know, it it's, uh, takes, t took some time for me. <laughs> What about the rest of you, Vera? I I was, you know, I was lucky enough to get the studio gig and um, well, you know, I went to I went to um, SUNY Purchase, so I did go to college for for this. Um, and uh, they had like a whole production um, major that I did. And uh, they had outboard gear there and they had tape machines and I had asked them to show us, like no one was using it, but I asked them. <laughs> to show us and they bought the tape for a project that I did, which was super cool. And um, so I kind of like dove in right away. I like knobs. <laughs> I like like turning knobs and I like pushing faders and I yeah. really like the like tactile, yeah, sensation of it all. And I just really like, if I, the first thing I do when I touch a piece of gear is I just take it to the extreme and I try and hear what it's doing. And then I, you know, and, and I kind of learn it that way. So I started like, as soon as I could. And actually before that, I, I grew up in Jersey and I went to a county college there and they had a recording program, which is how I even got into this in the first place. And um, we had to record to ADAT and DAT tapes. So ADAT's like our VHS tapes, essentially, that use for audio and DAT. So <laughs> we're smaller and, and we had to do it all, all analog to tape. And, um, you know, that, you know, I made my first big mistake there. I was listening on input and not what was hitting the tape. Oh, and I turned in yeah. my project and my professor was like, do you have a hearing problem? It's <laughs> 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 ridiculous. But so I, I kind of from the jump did it. And, you know, Electric Lady was an important place to me because I, um, I love the music that came out of there for the last so many decades. Like that's really my school of music, the Stevie Wonder, the Neo Soul, like that's like what I, I love. Um, but I, you know, I, I got in there because I had a friend who had already been an intern and was accepted as a GA, a general assistant, which is entry level, right? And so I got to kind of like when I, when I was ready to and had time and the studio was empty, I got to play around and have friends show me how to use things and like dive in even, even deeper. So. Did you hear what she just said, everybody? She had a friend. She had <laughs> a friend. Ready. She had a friend. Everyone. Yeah. I will say as someone who did not go to school for this, um, I didn't really completely understand how cool outboard gear was until I was able to re-rack an entire studio. And that happened because I was Instagramming local studios and somebody finally was like, okay, you can come over and be an intern for no money. <laughs> and I was small and nimble and I could get my fingers into the backs of the, the racks. And the guy that ran the place was like six feet. So it was like a real like win for me that this guy was so big. And he had all of the stuff, the pull text, the the LA two ways, the, the UA, the 1176s. And I just, I, I remember seeing this stuff online, like, Ooh, this is recording. Ah, like as I was getting into it and then I could see it in person and then I got to touch it and then route it and then deal with the patch bay and then use it. So that was just from hitting the gram. Not so. And that was years and years and years and years into my love of audio. I started on a four track. That's how old I am. <laughs> going back to the 90s. So 
for, I know that there's a lot of people out there who are like, well, this sounds like I need to go to school and that I need to get an internship and, and go that route. But if, if you're not that person, such as me, there are other ways to do it. As Lenny said, networking, just ask if somebody, if we weren't doing weird COVID times, I would totally have people over here touching my knobs. <laughs> <laughs> So I will say after the whole experience free racking, I ended up building my own rack based on what I needed to record. And also based off of like uh, Jasmine, I think mentioned getting to know the plugins. So basically I'm kind of wrapping this up right now is what, what I've learned from this is if you're really interested in outboard gear, check your plugins first, right? Get, get to know how they operate. And if there's something that you really love, like I'm gonna say the Manly Box Box, even though that's really expensive. Let's just say we have the budget get to know that and then maybe buy one depending on what you're recording right or or wa76 or wa73 right so then you get to can you guys hear that so then you get you get to know your gear before you start building your racks if that's the route you want to go if you're not able to like get in the studio if everybody's rejecting you because you're an old lady like we don't want you running around here build your own rack right save some money as lenny said right Chris, uh, yeah, Crystal said, understand what it is that you are recording. What do you need a preamp that might sound good on a vocal and an acoustic guitar? Or are you, you know, miking a Marshall amp? Like maybe you need a ribbon mic for that or, or, or maybe not SPL. I don't know. Um, I'm going off now, but anyway, that's, that's kind of what I'm hearing. Right. Does, does anybody else yes, want to well, add anything? Yes. Uh, what you're basically saying is learn your gear and why you want to use it and how to use it and plugins you can learn that way and you know outboard gear you know turn this knob and this is what it sounds like and turn it this way and this is what it sounds like so learn how it works and why you want to use it learn your gear and and the other thing i'll say too is that like i wouldn't be in a rush to buy it like if you need it or if it, it like it'll it'll become apparent why you feel like you need this piece of gear mm. yeah you can rent it too they have there's a lot of places doing gear rentals so you can always just try it for a day full day yeah. i love that yep yeah okay well i don't know how to end this <laughs> <laughs> thank uh, you yeah. so much this was this was great it was so nice to i I don't think we've ever met all as panelists. No. So it was really no. nice to meet you all and hear everyone's different experiences. Same. It's and, wonderful um, to meet you. Yes, definitely. This, this is so great. And thank you everybody out there in the audience who has, um, you know, joined us. I hope the, you enjoyed it and got something out of it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much and to each of you, you for have. giving us your time and your expertise because that is extremely valuable. And thank, thank you, Jess. Yeah, thank you, Jess, for moderating. Oh, it's lovely. Thank you, Sound Girls. Oh, thank, thank you, Sound Carrie Girls. For, yeah, putting this together. Yes. It's so yes. cool. Yeah. And hi, everyone. Oh, I love everyone's ma everyone's messages. Awesome. So happy to meet you all. <laughs> oh, good. We. I'm gonna save the chat. <laughs> <laughs> and I would, I would, I would guess that you guys would be open to people perhaps asking you some questions later Absolutely. down the line yeah you know yeah. so there is a question that came in unfortunately we didn't get to but like you talked about recording <clears throat> vocals can we can we talk about recording drums or other acoustic instruments so you know to that person sorry we didn't get to your your question but i think you could reach out to any one of these people and they'd be able to answer your question or dig deep if if i had had that growing up knowing that other and i will say this other women were doing this that would have changed everything for me so mm -hmm. anyway yeah, I agree. I agree. I, yeah. I was blessed. Uh, there were three other women assistants at the Village Studios when I started. That has not happened before or since. Wow. And, and that support that from those other women made a huge difference for all of us. We all excelled and succeeded and moved forward with the support of each other. And the studio was totally supportive of us, which was... It, the owner of the studio thought it'd be a great idea to have women um, in, in the studio because of uh, our 
organizational skills, he thought, and our ability to nurture, our egos wouldn't get in the way of the clients. We, we could do a much better job, he felt. And the energy was good. He felt that that was a, a balanced energy. Um, you know, not it, it just wasn't all about testosterone. And that was the owner's idea back in the 70s. So I lucked out. I had no idea that there was an issue with women in the studios. I had no other um, reference at all. There were just women there. And we had a woman maintenance engineer, yes. which was, uh, you know, still pretty rare. So um, it was a wonderful, supportive environment. And just exactly what you said, you know, um, the support of other women is really important. Go yeah. sound girls. Oh yeah, Yay. Yay. Sound girls. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. That's Thank it. you. Thank you. Bye, Thank everybody. You. Thank you. Bye.